Here we'll focus in a little more on the conformational analyses of ethane and bromoethane. As we've seen previously, ethane has one unique staggered conformer, which is an energy minimum, and one unique eclipsed conformation, which is an energy maximum. I'm going to go ahead and draw another example of the staggered conformation here on the right, just so that we can depict conformational change in ethane all the way from one staggered conformer to another. The difference in energy between the staggered and eclipsed conformations can be viewed as an activation energy, delta G double dagger. And for the ethane molecule, this difference is about 3 kilocalories per mole. Two explanations for the rotational barrier in ethane have been put forth, corresponding to the two effects we looked at in the last video. The first focuses on steric repulsion in the eclipse structure, using the idea that in the eclipse structure, because bonds are aligned, overlap between filled electron clouds is more severe in this conformation than it is in the staggered conformation. A more recent explanation focuses on stabilization within the staggered conformer due to filled empty orbital interactions. Because each CH bond bears a CH bond on the other carbon that's anti-periplanar to it, the staggered conformer is characterized by strong orbital overlap between sigma CH bonding orbitals, for example, like I'm showing on this back CH bond here, and sigma star anti-bonding orbitals of the CH bond that is anti-periplanar. Because this is a filled to empty sigma to sigma star orbital interaction, this results in stabilization of the staggered structure relative to the eclipse structure, where that kind of orbital overlap is not possible. Since the introduction of this filled empty orbital interaction explanation for the rotational barrier in ethane, there's actually been quite an interesting debate over what the true origin of the rotational barrier is. I've left it as an and or for the time being, but the thing you should appreciate is that more than likely both of these effects are playing a role in the rotational barrier of ethane, and we should recognize the importance of both in determining the barrier. Notice that rotation about the central CC bond in ethane causes an increase in the energy of the molecule. In this particular case, that energy increase is 3 kilocalories per mole, and that energy increase is referred to as strain. Strain is defined as the energy increase due to a conformational change from an ideal or lowest energy structure. And in this case, the kind of strain we're seeing has to do with a twisting motion of one carbon with respect to another. I compare it to squeezing a wet rag to cause the water to come out of it. Squeezing and twisting a wet rag introduces strain into the rag via the twisting motion of one hand with respect to another. The same thing is happening in ethane, in a sense. We're twisting one carbon with respect to another to go from the staggered to the eclipsed conformation. This leads to strain, and because a twisting motion is at the heart of this, the fancy term for which is torsion, this is referred to as torsional strain. But we'll see other types of strain as well. All of these have in common the idea that they cause an increase in the energy of a molecule relative to a conformation that's lower in energy or more stable. The molecule bromoethane, which is related to ethane, also has one staggered conformer and one eclipsed conformer. Let's quickly draw a conformational energy diagram for this molecule. As we would expect, the staggered conformation is an energy minimum, while the eclipsed conformation is an energy maximum. Further rotation of the eclipse structure along the same direction leads to a new staggered conformation that is equivalent in structure and energy to the original staggered conformation. The interesting thing to note about bromoethane situation is that the activation barrier here, the energy difference between the staggered and eclipsed conformations, is slightly higher than it is in the ethane case. It's about 3.6 kilocalories per mole. And we can attribute this to the larger size of the bromine atom relative to hydrogen. Because it takes up more space, steric interactions are more severe in the eclipse structure than they would be in the eclipse structure for ethane. Putting the carbon-bromine bond at a 60-degree dihedral angle alleviates that steric repulsion to a large degree. We've already discussed the idea that the difference in energy between the staggered and eclipsed conformers amounts to an activation energy or an activation barrier to rotation. This energy barrier is interesting not just as an energy, but also because it's related to the time required for an ensemble of molecules to pass from one staggered conformation to another. One way to model that time dependence is to show how the rate constant, 
depends on the activation energy. And this particular equation, called the Airing equation, is one attempt to do this. We won't use the Airing equation directly, but what I do want to get across right now is intuition about a relationship between activation energy and the time required for a process to occur. This applies well beyond conformational analysis. It applies to chemical reactions as well. If we imagine a first order process that converts A to B, so let's imagine the first staggered conformation as A and the second staggered conformation as B, at 20 degrees Celsius, we observe the following relationships between activation barrier energy, the rate constant, and the half-life of the process. At an activation barrier of 10 kilocalories per mole, the rate constant is quite large and the half-life quite small. We're in microseconds territory here. Even at 15 kilocalories per moles, we're still at a sizable rate constant and a very tiny half-life. We're now in the millisecond territory. 20 kilocalories per mole gets us up to human time scales, where the rate constant is something like 1 times 10 to the negative 3 per second, and the half-life is the very human intuitive time scale of about 100 seconds. And at 25 kilocalories per mole, the half-life balloons to 144 hours, and the rate constant gets very tiny. 10 kilocalories per mole is well beyond all of the activation barriers we've seen for conformational processes thus far. One point that this helps drive home is that conformational change is fast. Conformational changes like rotations around single bonds have low activation barriers, are relatively easy, and relatively fast. As a quick aside, these numbers were calculated by plugging in values for the constants here. Boltzmann's constant, Planck's constant, a temperature of 293 Kelvin, and R times T, where R is in units of kilocalories per mole per Kelvin, and a temperature of 293 Kelvin. The half-life is then calculated using the first-order half-life equation, the natural log of 2 divided by the rate constant.